We praise the Lord for the rain that we saw today. We got three quarter inch at my house, and uh, hopefully you got some of that too. Uh, Father, thank you for the day. God, just thank you for your word. Uh, God, thank you for your provision. Uh, Lord, you uh, know when, and God, the rain was such a nice thing, and even the cooler weather today was great. So God, uh, just be with our Bible study tonight. Uh, God, just uh, open uh, our minds and our hearts to what you want to say to us. And God, will be careful to give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I want to talk to you about the new man. All right, the new man. Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, we're going to start in verse 17. This I say, therefore... And testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentile walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the blindness of their heart. And I, you know, Paul here is not mincing words. I mean, that, that's just, that was one sentence, folks. Uh, but uh, obviously, you know, uh, he spent the most time of his ministry. I mean, the, it was the longest tenure at uh, the church in Ephesus. And one of the things uh, that that church had problems with, or one was false teaching. Others were, uh, you know, n- not, not living like Christians should live. And here's the deal. We're talking about the new man. But here in just a second, we're going to talk about the old man too. And let me just give you a quick, I mean, this is just real quick. The new man is your life in Christ. Okay? We all, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and all things become new. But here's the problem. Okay? When we talk about the new man and the old man, we don't get rid of the old man. I wish God had just... Take all that out, take it out of our head, take it out of our heart. And when we become saved, we walk like Jesus walked. But there's a process uh, that that Paul has even spoken about earlier, and it's called sanctification. Okay? And I love Philippians 1 6. He who began a good work in us will continue that till the day we die. And can we not all agree that God's still working on us? Okay, none of us have arrived spiritually. None of us are sinless. Zero. Okay, so Paul here is just talking about, and again, it wasn't, I mean, you know, you know, you, you, I'm thinking of not, not mature Christians. I, that's about as nice as I can put it. Uh, sometimes it's because they are new Christians. Some, sometimes because uh, they have these, things in their life that they just can't seem to overcome. And that's when that old man comes up and they go back to their old ways. And folks, people slip up. Okay, I understand that. But even when we slip up, we need to be quick to admit it and we need to quit it. When we are convicted by the Holy Spirit about something or or, or something that we have in our life that we have slipped back into, we need to repent and remember Repentance is a change of mind and a change of heart. Okay? We're already saved. But folks, the battle is in the mind, and we need to understand, you know, it, it's a heart thing. It's a heart issue uh, either way. So let me go back through this again. We testify in the Lord that we should no longer walk with the rest. Gentiles uh, is just the world. Okay? It's the lost world. And when we see the old man... It can also mean your flesh, okay, or worldly values, or even selfishness, okay? Sometimes that selfishness will will creep back into our lives, and we act like the Gentile world is what Paul is saying. In the futility of their mind, and folks, people that are lost have a different way of thinking. I don't know if you've witnessed to some, and you you know, I witnessed to a man about two weeks ago. And the reason he was the way he was was because of his upbringing. He was other, of another religion. And when I say religion, I can't even say it was more in 
tradition than who he, you know, than than anything else. His parents were this, his grandparents were this, and they were always this. So when I started sharing the gospel with him, he looked like a guy looking at deer in the headlights. And I had not talked to someone uh, like this in quite a long time. And so I literally had to go back to Adam and Eve, back to Genesis, to get to where we needed to be. And I gave him a lot to think about. We've had a conversation, and we're going to have another one this next week. But I'm simply saying, in their mind, they're thinking they're right. But, you know, when it comes to spiritual things, they are wrong. It, they, they're wrong, all right? They're not thinking like Christ does. Having their understanding darkened, and we know who is darkness. It's Satan. Satan wants to blind them to the truth of the gospel. That's Satan's job. Being alienated from the life of God. They don't think about God. And again, folks, many times it's just a choice. They don't go to church. They don't pray. They weren't raised in a Christian home. So there's really not a surprise here that these Gentile uh, in the Gentile wor world is that way. Be because of the ignorance. And you have to understand, ignorance is not knowing. Okay, no, not everybody, uh, you know, like just living in America. I mean, you think of all the, the places that you can get the gospel. I mean, you can get on computers, you get on the phone, you can get it on TV. You can get the gospel. And folks, there are a lot of people in third world countries has not been, you know, you know they have not had that uh, in, in their lives. Uh, because of the blindness of their heart, who, in, who being in past feelings have given themselves to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. And again, you know, uh, the, the selfish life, it's that life that says, it's all about me. All right, it's all about me. And folks, we, we do not need to go back to that lifestyle uh, when we get saved. But verse 20, but you have not learned, so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him have, and been taught by him the truth that is in Jesus. What is different about even our, our heritage and who we are? We base everything on the word of God. The, word, the, the world doesn't do that. They don't take God into consideration. And even in witnessing situations, the easy, easiest way for people to blow you off is says, well, I don't believe the Bible. And then we've got to go back to that, the authenticity of Scripture. We have to talk to them about the canonization. And, and again, it's hard, folks, for people who have not been exposed to the Bible and to the gospel. So it says that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. And I, I, I just know, you know, when I got saved, every once in a while these, these, the old man would just pop up in my head. Okay, and, and that's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, I wished when we asked for it and we truly repented and God forgave us, he'd just wipe, wipe our minds of all uh, the, the things that we uh, knew or we grew up or we, that was in our minds. But it's not that way, folks. It's not that way. But, but you're going to see here in a minute uh, how important it is living like a new man. Uh, and, and, of course, corruption is things that are wrong, lust is any evil desire, and being renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness. So, this should encourage you as a Christian and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And folks, it talks about our way of thinking. When we got saved, our way of thinking should have changed. And here's the deal. What you put into your head is what's going to come out in your action. That's why it's important to have a daily quiet time with God. That's why it's important to memorize Scripture. Why? So when Satan comes at you, I mean, that's exactly what Jesus did in Matthew chapter 4. Three times he said, it is written. Okay, so, you know, we can train our minds. We can just put all these good things into our minds and these Christ-like things 
and these scriptures into our minds where when we get in a situation, we can use scripture to do spiritual warfare. Romans 6 says it's best. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? And I love these two words. When I hit, God forbid, I'm telling you something, something clicks in me. Okay? Because the Holy Spirit's saying, man, you shouldn't do that. You need to stop. Okay? You need to ask God for forgiveness. And then to finish that out, how can I, who am dead to sin, live any longer therein? And here, it does two things for you. Number one, the Scripture, Satan hates Scripture. Okay? And you can do battle with Scripture. And number two, when you're quoting things, you're not thinking about the sin. You cannot think two thoughts at once, all right? So the renewing of our minds, uh, and, and folks, that's a daily process. We have to do it every day. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and in holiness. God is the creator of all. He is up in heaven. Uh, you know, he is God Almighty. He is the everlasting but there's two things that God gives us while we're here on earth, okay, that we need to understand. We have, number one, Jesus' example. I've said it a hundred times, you know, in the last few years. What would Jesus do? If you could answer that question, you've got, I mean, you're going to be renew, renewing your mind. Would Jesus say this? Would Jesus go there? Would Jesus watch this? Would Jesus have this attitude? Okay, so we have two advantages. We have Jesus' perfect example, which is righteousness. And again, we're not perfect. We all mess up. But folks, I'm telling you, we can't stay there. We, the quicker we repent, the quicker we repent, the more likely we're not to do it the next time. And not only Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. That's what the Gentiles don't have. That's our advantage over them. Not that we're better than them, but if we are a Christian, we have that Holy Spirit inside of us, speaking to us and talking to us. And folks, we need to listen to Jesus and we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. If you listen to Jesus and listen to the Holy Spirit, you will walk in that newness of life. Okay, and again, I, I just want to keep reminding, we're not perfect. Nobody is. But folks, we can, if we can get a hold of our minds, if we can, you know, because people even tell me they can't control their thoughts. You know, you can't control your dreams, and I understand that. Now, you can do things to, to, to affect your dreams, okay? Again, Christian music, uh, I've... I've had to uh, suggest to people that uh, they would get the Word of God, I mean, on your phone or something, and, and you put it beside your bed, and you just play the Word of God really, really low. Okay, if you're getting attacked, and you're losing sleep, and you're doing, I, I would suggest that. There's things that we can do, okay? But folks, being a new, the new man, we can make the right decisions. So here we get to verse 25, verse 25, and here you'll see five sins that he says a lot of Christians have a problem with, okay? And these are the things that even Christians, okay, new, you know, new Christians, old Christians have a problem with. Therefore, putting away lying, number one is the sin of lying. Let each of you speak truth in his neighbor, we are, for we are members one to another. And folks, we as Christians, we need to tell the truth every time. We don't need to exaggerate. We don't need to make excuses. Because here's the deal about a lie. If you'll lie to me one time, how do I know that you're not going to lie to me again? And that youth, I was a youth minister for 15 years, folks, and I'm just telling you, you know, you lie to your parents, and then you say, well, I'm not lying this time. Well, folks, that's a terrible example. And we, the society that we live in, oh, folks, we, we need to be men and women of truth. Our word needs to be our bond. If we say we're going to be somewhere, we need to be there. If we tell our kids we're going to do something, we need to do it. They need to see the truth 
of God in our lives. Verse 26, be angry and, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Number two is anger. Anger. And I know sometimes, okay, even <laughs> with those precious grandchildren that we love with all of our heart, they can get on your last nerve. And they can do something. And, you know, if you're not careful, you'll, you'll, just, you'll, you'll just snap at them. Okay? And, and anger, folks, not addressed will become a problem in your life. I told all my girls when I was a youth minister, do not date an angry man or an angry... If he's got anger issues, you don't need to be going out with him because sooner or later, that's going to be on you. Okay? So anger. And here's the deal about anger. Once you are angry, you can't take anger back. Man, I've seen Christians dress people down. Okay, I've seen Christians say words that just don't need to come out of their mouth. So we need to be careful, all right, about anger issues. And here's the key. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Man, confess it right then. Even in my marriage counseling, all right, I do not think, you know, uh, husband and wife should sleep back to back. And I'm not going to the couch, folks. We're going to get it straight so I can sleep in my own bed, all right? But anger is a problem uh, even that Christians have. Then it says, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor with working hands what is good, that he may, that he may have uh, uh, something to give to him who have a need. Now, I know you don't go out and shoplift. That's not what I'm talking about. But do you realize that if you're at a job, and you, you uh, work that job for eight hours, but for an hour you got in what, what, what we call goof-off time, you didn't do anything, you're stealing from that employer, okay? And it, people can justify it, okay? I mean, even a grape. <laughs> you walk by a grape in the supermarket, and you pop one into your mouth, you think, I ain't going to miss that. Folks, it's a grape. I don't, it's probably not even worth a nickel as far as that is. But I'm simply saying, do not steal time. Uh, do not steal from the Lord. We're talking about tithes and off. There's all kinds of ways, all right, that you can steal, and we do not need. We are that new man. Paul is giving examples of people of what we do not need to do as, or as Christians. But rather, Work, uh, let him labor, working with his hands wh that which is good, that he may have something to give to him in need. I'm telling you, you will never see me without at least a $20 bill in my billfold. And I carry more than that. Now, don't roll me because I carry more than $20. <laughs> but I'm simply saying, when the Holy Spirit tells you, and again, it's hard to know. Those folks street, sitting on the street corner or standing there, I know it, it's, you know, I don't want to even get into the argument there, but if I go buy one and the Holy Spirit says, roll your window down and give him 20 bucks, that's exactly what I do. All right? Because I feel like it was the Holy Spirit that told me. Okay? And he doesn't tell me often. I'm just telling you the street corner, but every once in a while, the Holy Spirit tells me to do it. And people who are hurting, there are people that need $20 worth of gas. All right? I mean, if you know, you see somebody that, you know, they're having trouble or they have a one gallon deal there, you know, and, and pouring it in, you know, it, obviously they either can only buy one gallon, you know, just what I'm saying is you recognize people's needs and we need, I mean, church people and lost people. We need, to, we need to be able to cut loose folks. And I know $20 is not worth what it used to be, but it could be everything to a hungry man everything. So, so the reason we have money is so that we can minister in Jesus' name. Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. That's the fourth thing, okay? And again, it's not just cussing, all right? And, and I know I'm guilty of this time, not cussing. <laughs> I just realized what I said. <laughs> but saying things, and I'm joking about it, but it's probably not funny to that person. And I'm real, I, you know, I've always been that I joke and, and there are times the Holy Spirit just says, you know, you, 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 I think you just hurt that person's feeling. 
And there's been several times, you know, church or wh- whatever. I've, I've got on uh, the phone after church. And uh, again, I remember uh, one time I did it to Stan Rowe. I, I, I said something joking to Stan. Uh, and, uh, you know, I called him up and he said, no, get out of here, preacher. Yeah, it didn't offend me at all. But folks, if you're convicted, you need to make the phone call. Okay, we need to be examples and we need to control what comes out of our mouth. But what is good and necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Okay, folks, if we as Christians, if we are children of God, uh, could encourage, I, I hope maybe you would even make it a point to encourage someone every day, somebody that you can encourage. Okay, a phone call, a text, a card. You would be amazed, you know, how, how much that would impart grace to people. I have literally had people say, you know, this, when, when, you know, when the Lord lays on my heart to send a card, they just say, you, you know, you, you know the timing. You just, and they'll say, you couldn't have done it at a better time. Because what you're saying is, you are important to me, and you took the time to do that. So we need to do that, folks. We need to edify people. In verse 30, and th- this is the fifth one, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? And there's sin in our lives, okay? I'm serious, folks. Could you imagine a service to where no one in this sanctuary was grieving the Holy Spirit? Nobody. You know what I think would happen, Cody? I think we'd be here a while. I think we'd be here a while. I mean, I was Sunday. I, I, I don't want to use the word blown away, but when I saw the response and people coming down, man, folks, people, I mean, it's obvious people are worrying about a lot of stuff, okay? And that's the key, folks. The way we do not grieve the Holy Spirit is when we obey the Holy Spirit, when we listen to the Holy Spirit. When we pray in the Spirit, okay, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Folks, I'm telling you in so many ways. I'll never forget our parsonage was right next to Alma First Baptist Church. And a couple got out. I was walking down. I there was you know, from the parsonage, there's a stairs, and I mean in the car, it was going like that. And they didn't see me. And when they got out, we met kind of like that. And they both goes, well, hi, Brother Mike. How you doing today? <laughs> now, what kind of attitude would they have taking that into church with them? That's what grieving the Holy Spirit means. Whom by you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let not all bitterness, wrath, clangor, anger, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And folks, it's a progression. You get angry, then you get mad, then you turn it into rage, and then uh, if you don't deal with it, it's going to be hate somewhere down the line. And the Bible tells us we should not hate, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, so, man, Paul is telling us, man, it's the new man. Act like a new man. Okay, we're not perfect. I understand the sanctification process, but, but... In in verse 32, here's the kicker here. Two words, and be ye kind. Don't you think this world would be better off if we were more kind to one another? I mean, these shootings are ridiculous. They are cold-blooded murder. And kindness goes a long ways, folks. Tender-hearted, and the other word is forgiving one another, even as Christ and God forgave you. Father, thank you. Thank you that we are... Christians, thank you that we have new life in you. Thank you that we are the new man. We have God up in heaven looking out over us. We have Jesus as our example, and we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And God, when these sins and these temptations come upon us, God, if we are in the Spirit, God, we can battle anger issues, and we can can battle grieving the Holy Spirit. So God, I pray that we would just wake up. I mean, before our feet hit the street, Lord, I pray we'd wake up and pray right then. 
and ask to be filled with the Spirit and ask for a filling and, and, and God, just walk with you. And God, I pray before we leave the house that we take time to read the Bible. God, we just, uh, man, we're in, a, we're in a rat race. We, it's just how fast can we go? And God, it's showing up in people's lives. God, it's just really not safe anywhere anymore. So God, I pray that we would be Spirit-filled Christians. God, thank you for your word. And God, just thank you that, uh, Lord, uh, we are saved. We are going to heaven. But God, I pray that people could look at our example and they could ask us, why didn't you get mad? And God, that just throws the door open. Let me tell you why. Because Jesus Christ is in my heart and in my life. Uh, God, I just, I, I just think the only hope this world has is Jesus. Uh, so God, help us to be that new man, spirit-filled, loving, kind, and forgiving person in Christ. And God, we'll give you the glory, not us. It's not about us. It's about you. So God, we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.